instrumentalizing humans. Uh, and this uh, sort of jumps off uh, from what we were just looking at with John Locke with the idea that even in a society where power has been given to a legislator or, or an executive, natural law still applies and human beings have to be, um, be respected in their life, liberty, and property. Um, but there is a tendency in this era, or, and maybe it's just, you know, coming to the consciousness of the way that under the feudal order, human beings were often instrumentalized. And then there becomes this, this, uh, this investigation of, of what is it that allow that, or, or, or maybe an investigation of maybe some rendition of, of treating people without respect to their life, liberty, and property, how that might be justified by the scientific revolution and um, the notion that perhaps the human is a mechanical, a biological machine without a soul and therefore can be treated in whatever way somebody wants. Um, so we have, you know, Boyle and Newton kind of set the, you know, have the, these groundbreaking works on science. And it begins people thinking, especially in light of what Descartes, the conversation that Descartes started, what does that, what does the new science say about human nature? Are humans merely biological machines and the product of forces of nature and perhaps this talk about soul and and uh, the ri natural rights of a human being as a person perhaps that just is a fairy tale and uh, of course we have in the midst of this we also have benjamin franklin's discovery about electricity and then um, you know, he, dis he didn't discover electricity. People knew, uh, had, had already identified the phenomena, the phenomenon of electricity. But what Benjamin Franklin uh, discovered was that lightning is electricity, that they are the same thing. Okay, so, um, and, and that's an interesting uh, discovery. Now, one version of this exploration of what it might mean to instrumentalize a human as just a biological machine is found in Marquis de Sade. And this is, uh, it's from Marquis de Sade and his writings, especially there's a couple of novels in which he really explores this idea of what it would mean to instrumentalize humans. Uh, the first one is Justine, and it was a, a pretty popular success because it's just such a, uh, it's an intriguing idea. It's not particularly well written, but it's like, it really gets under your skin, especially if you have any attachment to the old feudal order, and especially to the legitimacy of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, he is uh systematically he creates a nar narrative in which he systematically undermines the authority of roman catholicism because um the main character is this ca character justine and she's a very naive young girl uh very uh pious and virtuous and the you know alternate title is the misfortunes of virtue that virtue actually leads you into a life of misery uh, because Justine finds herself being uh, repeatedly kidnapped and raped and, uh, and enslaved uh, as a kind of sex slave. And there's this, um, you know, Saad takes much glee in going through all the minute details of these ritualistic 
um, sexual sort of uh, uh, situations. And it's from Saad that we get the, the, uh, the word sadistic. And, and it's also from, from especially the works of Marquis de Sade that we get the notion of sadomasochism. Uh, sado comes from Sad. Uh, and, and, mas and so sadism is when you take pleasure in other people's misery. And then masochism is when you take pleasure, especially a sexual pleasure, in being denigrated and 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 whatnot, and and being forced into um, uh, discomfort, especially in a sexualized way, and and Justine is full of sadomasochistic scenarios, um, and many of the sadist in the story. Um, the people who do the abuse to Justine are lords and bishops, um, you know, no, nobility, counts, um, and bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. And they have these elaborate sexualized rituals that they do. Uh, and then Juliet is the, 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 the companion piece of Justine, Juliet is Justine's older sister who then in, in Juliet sh uh, shows up and Justine and, and Juliet meet. And Juliet, uh, rather than being virtuous is uh, a total scoundrel herself who, who lies and cheats. She's a fraudster and she is someone who is a sadist, uh, a sexual sadist herself. And, um, and she lives, a, a, according to the narrative, a wonders, wonderfully fabulous, uh, happy lifestyle where Justine is always miserable and, you know, uh, is always feeling sorry for herself and depressed and everything. Uh, Juliet is perfectly self-satisfied and, um, and is explaining to Justine and others how, you know, the best way to live is to just take advantage of people and to uh, gain sexual satisfaction from the misery of others. Um, so, and, and especially in Justine, um, there is this philosophy that's built into the narrative uh, about nature, that it is the nature of things that it is just nature and natural processes that cause uh, certain people to be sadist and that because it's quite natural, it's therefore uh, good. And so um, the whole, both of these narratives really present the idea that uh, since we live in a world of nature and there aren't really these spiritual, the spiritual mumbo jumbo that, that Roman Catholic bishops talk about. Um, you know, it's really what's going on behind all the BS is a bunch of sadomasochism. And, and Justine is kind of presented as a masochist that at some level enjoys the torture that she undergoes. But, but naively and like unconsciously. Uh, Juliet is fully consciously a sadist. And um, yeah, so these are interesting uh, ways of looking at things. But this, uh, going back to the question of the mind-body dualism, what if there is no, no mind, no soul? Uh, I mean, Marquis de Sade would still think that people had minds, but only as some kind of epiphenomenal sort of uh, sort of experience that's riding on top of mechanical processes of the body. Um, and now there's two ways of reading Marquis de Sade. This is kind of like the same with Machiavelli, 
you can read Marquis de Sade as being a legitimate, authentic, uh, honest purveyor of this philosophy that's demonstrated in the book, or you can read it as ironic and actually as an argument that human society as we would like it with goodness and kindness depends upon people believing in the existence of a soul and even if not the existence of a soul still some sort of um, duty to protect and promote the life liberty and property of others okay but in in these books the Justine is, is constantly having her life, liberty, and property uh, taken away from her and, and exploited. Okay, so, uh, and then another rendition of, of this instrumentalization of the human being is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And so, uh, and she calls it, or, or the modern Prometheus, um, because uh, now the Frankenstein of Mary Shelley is quite different from the Frankenstein of early 20th century Hollywood, uh, but more recent versions of Frankenstein, like there was one with uh, Robert De Niro that uh, closely tracks the narrative of, of uh, Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, you know, Frankenstein is not a, a zombie type character uh, he is somebody that is brought back to life from the dead and, and constructed in a mechanical way out of body parts, okay? So Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein, of course, is the doctor, uh, Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein's monster uh, is constructed out of... Um, out of body parts and and revitalized through electricity derived from lightning okay and so um, now electricity is seen as this kind of vital force that can can bring uh, body parts uh, assembled in a mechanical way it can bring them back to life it's a sort of interesting thought experience experiment and the point that Shelley wants to make and what makes the monster monstrous and, um, and problematic for human society is that the monster is just body parts and has no soul. So that's what makes it a kind of Gothic um, horror story. And, uh, And so that's kind of the explanation of, of why the monster is um, sort of lacks a moral compass um, because the monster doesn't have a human soul. And, and then um, uh, another aspect of this that, that is embedded in in Shelley's Frankenstein that's kind of interesting. And, and I should tell you that this story is very short. It's a novella, it's a very short book. So it's something that can be read uh, without too much effort. And it's pretty interesting. Um, Frankenstein's monster is also an early rendition of the idea of artificial intelligence because the monster is super intelligent because each body part that he's composed of uh, has like memory built into the body part. So he has access to memories from all the various people of which, of which he's composed. And uh, so he's super talented, like playing the violin. He's a great mathematician. He can consume books very quickly. Uh, and he has this like super intelligence. And so it's an early version of artificial intelligence and, and then the, how it goes wrong and how it, it threatens society 
um, also is part of the way that we still think about the threat to human society from artificial intelligence. Um, the most specific example that really matches up here is the movie Ex Machina, which came out a few years ago with, uh, with uh, Oscar Isaacs as the Dr. Frankenstein type character. Um, so you, you might, you might uh, be thinking about these things. Again, you know, the matrix is, you know, one rendition of some of the themes here. Um, Frankenstein is one rendition. These are, we're kind of familiar with these, but uh, especially the Shelley version uh, is, is exploring these ideas in a pop culture kind of way. And, um, and, you know, these are all issues that um, the current bourgeois capitalists uh, that are running the United States and the world are really getting steeped in, but maybe in a, in a maybe they don't, haven't really read the philosophy, but they're getting it all kind of secondhand through pop culture. It's hard to tell, uh, but people like Elon Musk, um, He's like the main person that comes to mind. Uh, he's kind of thinking about these things and promoting a political agenda that uh, is maybe a little bit confused about these things. And may maybe he doesn't realize that this is stuff that was already discussed hundreds of years ago and he thinks he's saying something new. Um, but it's interesting to think about all this stuff in relationship to pop culture and things that are happening in our culture today. And of course, there's always the, in the background, the bogeyman of social media and how that is, you know, uh, threatening human society at the moment. All right, so I'll cut that off here.